My name is Peter Fernandez, and uh, I've been in show business, uh, sheepers, over 60 years. 62, I think it is now. Uh, I started actually before going into show business. I was a child model. And then when I was 11, I got my first Broadway play. And ever since then, I've been an actor and a writer and a director. First, I started as an actor in foreign films and English dubbing. And uh, because I had been a writer, I started writing dubbing scripts. And if you write them, you direct them. And um, I started acting. I, I, I ghosted a lot of a series called Astro Boy, the scripts. And the same with another series called Gigantor, uh, on which I was one of the voices. And uh, at that point, because of my background, uh, Translux Pictures got in touch with uh, an editing place called Zavala Riz, with whom I'd been working closely, and said, uh, we have this Japanese series and we want to distribute it. So it was turned over to me, with the only instructions being Americanize it. And I got uh, very rough translations of each episode, but I had to write the lip sync. And because I'd been writing it for foreign films from any language into English, um, I used that to, as a basis so I knew what was going on. But I had a free reign to think of all the names of the villains, uh, the leads, of course. Speed's uh, endurance uh, has to do, of course, with the age of the people who rushed home to see it. They're in their 30s and 40s today. But then MTV ran the series a few years ago, and then the Cartoon Network. So now it's got a whole new audience of kids. Hopefully, it'll be around for another 50 years. Uh, you know, And it won't lose its value over that time, because it's still got the family values. And the Mach 5 looks so modern, it'll be a long time before uh, our cars look like the Mach 5. The Mach 5 is the most complex and ingenious car ever built. A tribute to my father's imagination, genius, and technical skill. Well, the Mach 5 is a very futuristic car, but it was believable in a way. Um, it could do all the things you wish your car could do, uh, and more. <laughs> I don't know about those saw blades uh, in heavy traffic. <laughs> but you could. it would be nice to think you could jump over a whole bunch of cars ahead and beat the light. <laughs> Um, I got in some driving tips, one of which I practiced myself when I was writing speed. Um, such as, you know, when you're entering a curve, take your foot off the accelerator, halfway through accelerate, gives you better traction. I learned that from speed. <laughs> speed Racer is, I think, a pretty much straightforward guy. He wants to win races, and of course he's good family member, and uh, I think he's not a complicated character. Um, he's a bit of a do-gooder, and uh, certainly wants to solve crimes and uh, fight off evil, but don't we all? <laughs> Maybe I read the wrong books. <laughs> when Racer X first appeared, I would only get the scripts from Japan, let me say. <clears throat> um, to one, two, or three at a time. I didn't know myself what was coming up in future episodes. So suddenly this character appeared, and I didn't even know what to name him. But his helmet gave me a clue, and I said, okay, X, he'll be Racer X, because X is an unknown quantity. Thank goodness I did, because later on, I myself found out that it was Speed's older brother. And that's how he became Rex, because it fitted in with the X. Racer X is a more complicated fellow than uh, Speed. Uh, okay, he ran away from home, felt terrible about wrecking the first car. Um, but why he keeps secret all the time, I still don't know. He certainly has atoned for what he did, um, but he just keeps a secret eye protecting Speed. Perhaps he feels he can never go back to Pops. Trixie, uh, Trixie was a little bit complicated, I think. Uh, she loved speed, although we never said so, but it was obvious. Um, at first, I think uh, a, a lot of audience maybe thought it was his sister, but there was so much interplay 
in a very subtle way. In those days, you had to be very careful about any interplay between uh, boys and girls, particularly younger ones, not like today. Um, Trixie, actually, we don't know anything about her background. I don't know her last name. Now, maybe I did at one episode, but I don't think so. We ever never. Oh, she was always Trixie. Well, Sprite and Chim Chim are the uh, humor of each episode, uh, the obvious humor. That's mostly why they were, I think, inserted on the series. But they always did something that is so dangerous, getting in the trunk of that car. When it came to casting Speed Racer, uh, I called upon people whose work I had known over the years. For uh, Pops, uh, who was a, f a fellow I'd known since he was 16, Jack Curtis, who had a very announcerist type voice, announcer-ish. Uh, but he had to do Pops, so that made him, he had to get very gravelies. So at the end of the day, he had no voice left whatsoever. Hey, wait just a minute! Who gave you permission to be a racer, huh? For Sparky, uh, Jack Grimes, whom I had known since, I guess, he was 10 years old, and uh, who grew up in radio on a show called Let's Pretend initially. I was just trying to find out if the car's equipped with any special inventions that I don't know about. You want to learn all about the mammoth car, eh? Uh, right this way. Jack's a funny little guy. Um, then for uh, Trixie, uh, I used someone who, with whom I had acted only several times, but who worked at Tetra, the dubbing company, as a slater just to pay her bills, Corrine Orr. That's Bridal Sparky and Chim Chim down there. I was afraid something would go wrong. I'd better go down and pick them up. And uh, that's the cast. There were only four of us. Being director, I cast myself as Speed <laughs> and Racer X. You, what are you doing here, Speed? Practicing. You must not be in the race. I will be, and I can beat you. I'll prove it. A day for doing speed, which usually ran... Well, we always started at 9.30. Um, and uh, usually finished around 5, 5.30, with one hour off for lunch. Other than that, it was concentrated work. We all had fun doing uh, the show. We all got along very well. That's the main thing. And, uh, of course... One or the other, or one of us would groan because suddenly, instead of short lines with action, would come a long speech that I could not cut into a separate loops. So you had to memorize the whole speech instantaneously, <clears throat> watch the screen, come the beep for the cue to start, beep, 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 start the speech. Well, that's the end of that terrible gang of assassins. They tried to assassinate Princess Gracious of Ambrosia and then President Montebank of Avalonia, but they failed both times. It's the end of that gang, but there will be others. As long as men seek power illegally, there will be evil things done in the world. But I'll do all I can to see that men like them never succeed. If everyone did the same, it would be a more peaceful world. That's one of the reasons why I think speed sounds so good. Because we dubbed it to picture. Nowadays, a lot of the things are read. A lot are done in Canada on what they call the band system, where the actor goes in and reads the line. And at a certain point, uh, as the band, the words go across the screen, that's when he should be at that word. But it, a lot of it sounds like reading to me. It doesn't have that action, that involvement. I think we'll be safe now. The path we made will be too narrow for them to follow us on. Oh! It was budgeted for three actors at $125 each per episode. Uh, I knew I needed a fourth actor. There was no way we could do this show with only three. So I called my friend Jack Grimes, and I said, Jack, I'm doing this cartoon series, and uh, the pay is $125 an episode. Would you split with me? So Jack and I did each episode for acting at $62.50. In those days, and to today, there are no residuals. So that was what we got paid as actors. <clears throat> I got paid uh, extra for writing and directing of uh, $250 an episode, which 
Today, if you did that on a cartoon series, you probably got $25,000 an episode. Tomorrow, the great alpine race begins. A race which we must not lose. We, we will not lose. lose. We I want to talk to the mammoth car. Listen, you stoneheads, I gave you orders to get rid of those two nosy kids. Speed Racer had very interesting villains, I think. Uh, each one had very definite characteristics, which helped me think up a crazy name for them. Uh, Cruncher Blog with the mammoth car. I mean, he was a massive guy. Ace Doocy. My name's Ace Doocy. Snake Oiler. <laughs> and of course, the detective, Inspector Detector. Outrageous that I, I named him that, but anyway, I had fun doing it. I've had wonderful experiences with Speed Racer fans. Um, of any age, too. Um, first of all, they always somehow associate me with Speed. And they know I did the voice. They come, oh, I'm so glad to meet you, Speed. Well, Speed was an animated character. How do I explain this? So I say, thank you very much, and act as if it was something I had done on screen. They feel as if they know me by watching the animated series of Speed Racer. It's very flattering, actually. <laughs> I feel very gratified having done Speed because <clears throat> of the reactions I get from the people I meet. At the time, it seemed like just another job, doing a cartoon series. We've always done the best we can with any job. And uh, who would have thought? It's still going strong. I think Speed Racer is popular and has been over the years. For a couple of reasons. The main one to me is that you care about speed. You care about him surviving all these uh, terrible things that happen during races and before and after the races. And you care because you know his family, you know their relationship. And his family, his friends, Sparky, uh, his father certainly. And so it's not just a show with car crashes and racing. It shows a lot of relationships reflection of life and um, I think those are the reasons actually that speed has survived.